Second Chronicles chapter 5. Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. And according to 1 Kings 6.37, it was seven and a half years. And Solomon brought in all the things that David his father had dedicated, and the silver, and the gold, and all the instruments put he among the treasures of the house of God. So there is more even after the house of, uh, house of God is made. There's, there's abundance of gold, abundance of silver, and he puts in the storehouse. Things are going to be need to be fixed. Things are going to be redone. Things are going to be needed. So there was a surplus. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, unto Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. Three places, the same place. Jerusalem, city of David, and Zion, the capital Z. So, temples built, we're going to move the Ark. And that's what this chapter is going to be about. This will be the time when the Ark will be put stationary. The only time the Ark is going to move again is when God raptures it into heaven. The ark is not there when Babylon comes and destroys the temple. It's in heaven. So if you want to make a movie trying to find the ark, you make it into vain. Because the only way you can get to heaven is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't think the Nazis would have something that belonged to the Jews. I don't think God would allow that. I just would not think that would be the people to have it. Wherefore, all the men of Israel settled themselves unto the king in the feast which was in the seventh month. And this would be the... The seventh month had the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Trumpets. This is one of the active months. And doesn't tell us which one. If you're going to assume, and I'm going to assume that you can throw this in the garbage can, it would be the Feast of Tabernacles. That would be also probably the date of Jesus Christ. And would it not be the time that Jesus was born? When he was born would be the time that... The, the children of Israel celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles, the time that the Ark was put into the temple. Uh, and I don't have scripture for that. It's my assumption. And for sin, I need to repent and believe uh, and uh, put it under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's one of the, the celebrations of the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came. And they were supposed to. And the Levites took up the Ark and they brought up the ark and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle. Now this would be at chapter 1, verse 3. This is at Gibeon. So they're bringing everything that Moses' tabernacle had that was at Gibeon. The ark is already there in, in Jerusalem by David. They're bringing everything. Where in the tabernacle, these did the priests and the Levites bring up. Solomon is not making the same mistake that his father made. I guarantee somewhere along the line, David had a little talk with Solomon. You know, when you move that ark, don't put it on a cart. You need the Levites and you need the priests. And when you go set forth to do that, make sure they tell you exactly what to do. I guarantee somewhere along the line, David had that revelation to Solomon. Because he lost uh, Uzzah during that. He, he wanted to do right, but he didn't do it right. And... You know, you want to do right by witnessing to people, but you don't do it God's way. You do much damage and you cause death. And that causes bitterness. That causes a breach. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him before the ark uh, yeah, sacrificed sheep and oxen, which could not be told nor numbered for the multitude. There's just many animals. And the priest brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Notice it wasn't on a cart. Unto his place. Ooh, people in America would hate that today. That's his. That's a pronoun mean male. They today don't even know what they are. There it is. God is not neutral. God is not feminine. His. To the oracle, which is the most holy place of the house, unto the most holy place. He does his own definition. Even under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread forth their wings over the place of the ark. And the cherubims covered the ark. 
in the staves thereof above. All right, chapter 3, verse 11. We're going to see something very interesting here, I hope. Chapter 3, verse 11. And the wings of the cherubim were 20 cubits long. One wing of the one cherubim was 5 cubits, reaching to the wall of the house, and the other wing was likewise 5 cubits, reaching to the wing of the other cherubim. Two cherubim. And the one wing. Okay, so here are two cherubims in the oracle in the most holy place. Two. Now let's go over to Exodus 25. Exodus 25. We'll run a couple of verses here. Two cherubims. Exodus 25, I think 16. Well, I got a terrible hand. 18. 18. All right, now watch this. Thou shalt make two cherubims of gold of beaten work. All right. Does Solomon make the, the ark, verses 10 to 16? No, that's already made. He's going to move the ark. And on the ark is a mercy seat. And on, on that mercy seat are two cherubims. Solomon does not build that ark. He doesn't make the mercy seat. But in the most holy place, the oracle of Solomon in his temple, there are two cherubims. There are two cherubims on that ark and the mercy seat coming into the temple. Two plus two equals four. So let's look at Revelation chapter four, verse six. Why four? Because it's scripture. There's one missing. Ezekiel 28, the fallen cherubim, Isaiah 14, I think that is. But uh, Revelation chapter 4, uh, 4 verse 6. There are four cherubims now going into that most holy place. Why? And before the throne, you mean the mercy seat, God's seat, there was a sea of glass like in the crystal. In the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The first beast was like a lion. The second beast was like a calf. The third beast had a face as a man. The fourth beast had a, uh, was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings. That's kind of interesting. Now, let's run to Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 5. Ezekiel 1, verse 5. You don't get the full picture of heaven till you get to Solomon's temple. When Moses and them are carrying that, that, that ark, there's only two cherubims. Ezekiel 1, verse 5, Out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was... This was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Everyone had four faces. Everyone had four wings. There they are again. There are four. The fifth cherubim is fallen. We're not going to get into that. But when we come into chapter 5, they walk, the priests walk into the most holy oracle. There is two cherubims right there right now. They're bringing in two more on the mercy seat. In the center of the oracle is the throne, is the mercy seat. And there are four cherubims around that mercy seat as it is in heaven. How did Solomon know what Ezekiel was going to write? And you stay, you stay in Second Chronicles. Let me look up Ezekiel. Five, 595 BC, almost 500 years. After Solomon builds this, this oracle. Over a thousand years before John even writes the book of Revelation. And already we see if you study the Bible. Not just read but study the Bible. With chapter 3 and then the study of the ark. Here comes four cherubims in the most holy place. And when we get to heaven there's going to be four cherubims there. Crying holy, holy, holy. You know when the rapture happens, 
or if a saint dies today and goes to be absent, absent from the body present, you know they're going to freak out because they don't learn in church. They're going to be faced with four beasts, the lion, the, the man, the eagle, and the ox. Who is that? It's in the Bible. You know, people who profess to know the Bible, they're not going to be, they're, going, they're not also going to be scared to the fact is that when they get to glory right now, up to Revelation chapter 12, that Satan is going into heaven. They're going to see Satan when they die and when we're raptured. <gasps> What's that? That's Satan. Oh, my church, my pastor said there wasn't any. There is. There is. So there's four cherubims. Verse 8, chapter 5, verse 8. And the cherubim spread forth their wings over the place of the ark. And the ark is in heaven, book of Revelation. And the staves thereof, uh, over this ark, and the staves thereof above. They drew out the staves of the ark. That's what they carried it with. This has not happened ever before. They're pulling those out. There's no one's ever going to carry this again. It's not going to go on people's shoulders no more. They drew out the staves of the ark that the ends of the staves were seen from the ark before the oracle. That would be the holy place. You would walk into the holy place. There's the tables. There's the candlesticks. There's the altar of incense. And there's the staves. You go through that veil, the one that Jesus will rent. There's the, there's the ark. There's the mercy seat. And there are four cherubims. So when you get to glory, you're going to see the ark and you're not going to see those staves. No one's ever going to carry it again. I wonder how they did in that movie. And the ends of the staves were seen from the ark before the oracle, but they were not seen without. And there it, and there it is unto this day, whoever wrote this. They're not there today. No temple there. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables which Moses put therein at Horeb, the Ten Commandments, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. Now, that's kind of interesting because what about Aaron's rod that budded? And then the manna, the little pot of manna. Hebrews 9, 4. Hebrews 9, 4. We'll start in 9 3. And after the second veil, that's the veil that Christ ripped, the tabernacle was called the holiest of all, most holy place, which had the golden censer. That's kind of interesting because it says it's in a holy place, but that's another study. And the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, where it was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded. And the tables of the covenant. What do you do with that? I don't know. It's not a contradiction because there is no contradiction in the Bible. I'm just going to tell you, I don't know. But I don't think anybody popped that lid open. Other touched it any right there on the ground dead. So I was going to say, I don't know. I'm not afraid to say that. Verse 11. And it came to pass when the priests that come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified, set apart, and did not them wait by course. So there was a specific priest designed for this. And they would have been of the tribe of, oh, why is it? As soon as I think it in my head, it goes, um, Kohath. And the Levites that were the singers, all of them at Asaph, and every time you're going to see singers, you're going to see Asaph. He was the main guy of David for the Psalms, for the song, for the music instrument. Of Heman. So I think they have a, a man of super character like that called He-Man. And he wasn't like that in the Bible. He was a singer. Of Jeduthim. Which, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, 
Now notice how it says their sons and their brethren. And I'm thinking of a per particular family right now who are just musically inclined in the in the proper act, arts to serve the Lord. And to me, I'm going to say again, I'm going, I'm going to assume, I'll put my foot in the mouth and if I need to confess my sin, I'll confess it. It seems like a family travels amongst the genes of music, art, or that, because here they are now. This one whole family are known for the music. So the holiness people don't believe in music in the church, symbols. I don't ever seen that in the church. And psalteries. And harps. The harps that you see in the church today are laying down, called a piano. String instruments. Stood at the east end of the altar. Now that was not there in Moses' design. That's a brazen altar. At the brazen altar on the east end, you had a choir and orchestra. And what we read already about David, these men were well trained. They were well practiced. They were efficient in their job. It wasn't done haphazardly. It wasn't done fooling aroundly. It was done proper for God. And if you're standing there in the courtyard by the altar, and if you're going to fool around as they have in the bayou, I would be afraid that fire or something will take get rid of you. I'm going to say that because I've seen a lot of karaoke in churches today. I've seen a lot of choir fooling around, singing songs, I'll call them songs, that ought not to be sung. Playing music sound like a bar room. You call it whatever you want. Only blue grass that you get when you flush the toilet. You like it tough. Stood at the east, east end of the altar. And when they had 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Now can you imagine that? 120 priests with trumpets. That had to be loud. That had to be loud. And it came even to pass, even the trumpeters and singers... Whereas one to make and make one sound to be heard in all praising and thanking the Lord. Unity of the music, of the instruments, of the cymbals, the psalteries, the harps, and the trumpets. And they were to give praise and thanks to God, Jehovah, not to the flesh, not to man, not how great our church is. How great thou art, not how great we are. Perfect unison. And when they lifted up their voice, so they sang with the trumpets. So they sang with the trumpet and cymbals and instruments of music. This is an old, the old way of spelling it. And praise the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. You find that in the book of Psalms. That then the house was filled with a cloud. Even the house of the Lord. Now you'll find these in the book of Psalms as your hymn note designed by God in the 66 books. I guarantee they're not going to sing a hymn or a psalm that defied the scriptures. As there are hymns today in hymnals that defy the scriptures. You're not going to sing, oh, my eyes have seen the glory of the Lord, you liar. No, you didn't. You saw the northern army come, and they're not God. You know, oh, Bethlehem, oh, Bethlehem. Singing about Bethlehem. You don't sing about Bethlehem. You sing about God, Jesus Christ. We three kings. We don't know if there were three. You're lying. Shut up. Throw it out. Rip it out of the page. I even seen in the hymn, though, they claim to be the Psalms. And when you match it with the Psalms, it has nothing to do with the Psalms. It's been rewritten. Then don't put, this is psalm number. You have changed the psalm according to the modern Bibles. You get up and preach, oh, we got the King James Bible. We're against modern Bible. Now open up this hymn that destroys the psalm. Aren't we just a great church? Shut up. So here's this cloud. So that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. <laughs> this is one thick cloud. 
This is a holy cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Now one play, a couple plays, Ezekiel 43, 5. This was amazing. Ezekiel 43, verse 5. And you know, it doesn't tell you what color the cloud was or anything. This says a cloud. They're all different kinds of clouds. But I've never had a cloud where I couldn't walk into it. So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, that's the temple, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Wow, that's interesting. One more place. Chapter 44, verse 4. Chapter 44, verse 4. Now, this is all about the temple. This is the future temple that's not built yet in Ezekiel. This is going to be the millennial uh, temple that Jesus Christ, the Holy, will walk in. And they're not going to crucify him. And they're not going to say, look how beautiful this building is. Yeah, in 70 AD, they're going to tear it off. He ain't going to do that this time. And it ain't going to be about the building. It's going to be about Jesus Christ. It's going to be anti-church doctrine. I mean, those, those disciples were, were your future Baptists. Oh, Lord, isn't this building is so great? Yeah, going to tear it down. Then brought he me in the way of the north gate before the house. That's the temple. And I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord, and I fell upon my knees. Well, look at that. Whatever this glory, whatever this presence of God is, makes you fall down. He ain't the man upstairs. He ain't a God that's going to revel in your sin. He's a holy and righteous God that when he's there, you're not going to be. That God allowed Moses to a point to put him in a cleft of rocks. Okay, I'll let you see. I, you can't see my face, but I'm going to let you see my back part. And then he comes down and his face is just glowing. Yet that didn't happen to John. On this side of grace. John had already seen God through Jesus Christ. Right, let's, let's look at that. First John, that one, we'll look up that one. One more verse. Oh, the Bible's good. John doesn't get the flashlight because he's already seen God. First John 1.1. 1, 1. And you match this with John 1.1. 1, 1. That which we had from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. See, he's seen God. Which we have looked upon. And our hands had handled, he laid on the breast of God, the word of life. Verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have the fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship with the Father, that's God, and with his Son, Jesus Christ, that's God. That's God manifest in the flesh. They looked at him and they did not have halos. If Jesus and the 12 disciples had halos, why were there people in the gospel say, who's that coming? Would not the halo give it away? Would not, okay, you see Jesus standing before Pilate. He's, got, he's the only one in the world besides his 11 disciples now that got halos. If, the, if, I mean, if he had halo, would they not say, crucify him, crucify him? No, no, that's God. Look at the big round. No, see? They had no. They knew who Jesus was, but they didn't know who Jesus was. So when we see what we're studying today, we're looking at the most holy place, and we see heaven through the eyes of John, through the eyes of Ezekiel. Those four beasts, and that ark today is in heaven where John sees it. I don't think Solomon saw the ark. Remember, it was covered. When you moved it, you had to cover it. When John sees it, there it is. Glory to God.